Hej och välkomna till poddepisod nummer fem. Vi ville inleda det här programmet med musik från Ukraina. En sång som även blivit som en kampsång i Ukraina. Så ikväll kommer programmet att vara på engelska så därför kommer vi gå över i att tala på engelska. Vi kommer börja alldeles strax i klockan. Och nu, mm, yes, yes. Klockan är en minut över sju. En minut, eh, precis, en minut över sju. <laughs> so welcome to the recording of pod episode number five. Um, this is a series that the Climate Alliance is doing from the 11th of April until the 11th of September. Tonight we'll talk about the climate debate based on the situation that has arisen in Ukraine and how it affects us. The program tonight, as I said before, will be in English. My name is Mariam Jalop Tulusan and together with me is uh, Olivia Alm Brillantes. And we will be hosting the seminars. Yes, we are doing this series of conversations in collaboration with Andreas Aldrin at Levende Video. And we would like to send a special thanks to the researchers uh, from Researchers Desk, who will also participate in the panel during this program series. We will look at current politics, ethics and morals questions around that activism, the artistic expressions in the climate struggle. For the last 50 years in Europe, we have been living in peacetime. This has been very beneficial to our budgets and most of the European countries have been spending less than 3% on tanks, missiles and warships. In a time when we need to focus on the climate and the threat to our civilization, we are instead looking to increase our military budgets due to the war in Ukraine. The war has unstabilized the world order. The longer it goes on, the more fear and money will be spent on military all across Europe and the world. The war in Ukraine could also become a wake-up call for Europe to become less dependent on the fossil fuels and the fossil energy sources which is the absolute best way to undermine the Russian war machine. Oil and gas are large export products from Russia and uh, oil and gas are also often the basis of many dictatorships around the world. We would like to welcome our Ukrainian guests, one of them residing in Sweden and the other in Kiev. Um, so we have uh, Virginia Sasadiako, head of climate department at the environmental organization Eco Action, who previously worked for, among others, Bankwatch and have been on internship at the Environment Committee in the Ukrainian Parliament. Her experience in environmental protection and climate policy is more than eight years. And then we have Inna Sovson previously Minister of Education from the revolution in 2014 until about 2018. Before the revolution, she was at the Visual Culture Center in Kiev, where, among other things, independent lectures and uh, art exhibitions were held during Yanukovych's final year. Now you are in the Ukrainian parliament. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for the work you are doing to create peace and democracy. Welcome in. Yeah, so we, would, so we would like to start to ask uh, questions to uh, Inna. So you're now residing in Kiev. What kind of uh, work and support can you do from in Kiev? 
Well, of course, uh, the lives of all of us have changed a lot uh, since uh, February 24th. And uh, uh, even though I am living in Kyiv for the first month, I was actually not able to leave at my own place because uh, I live in the north of the city where the Russians are coming, were coming from. So I was actually uh, living with some of my friends living in the south of the city. Uh, then I got uh, back to my home, but then I also continued to travel from Kiev to Western Ukraine quite a lot because my son is in the Western Ukraine and I just go there to see him. But then, of course, my work is, is mainly here in Kiev. Uh, the, the things that I'm mostly concentrated on right now, are, well, uh, initially, uh, uh, primarily the, the international work. Uh, that is raising awareness in the international community about the crimes committed by Russians in Ukraine, be it through the media, through talking to different uh, members of parliament all over the world, uh, uh, talking to uh, diplomats uh, and all of that. That has been a, the biggest probably part of my work um, as of right now. I'm helping a little bit the military, but I wouldn't say that, uh, that this volunteer work and helping the military is, is the main focus of my work. I'm typically just helping the, the unit uh, where I know some people and then I can help fundraise for the units uh, where uh, I know people and I know their specific needs. But yeah, I think my main focus has been uh, doing this. What I'm doing right now is raising awareness globally about the situation in Ukraine. So uh, actually doing this uh, the, this interview is, is one of the ways of, of how I've been functioning the last uh, well two and a half months now. And then, of course, the parliament is in session. Uh, but uh, in a very specific manner, we do not hold uh, long-term sessions for security reasons. They are not public, meaning that they are not broadcasted on television, again, for security reasons because of the uh, threat of, of Russian missiles hit. Uh, but we do some work uh, of uh, changing the legislation of what needs to be done in order to, uh, you know, to uh, address the challenges that we are facing uh, here in Ukraine because of the war. So, so those are the main things that uh, I have been working on. Some of uh, my, my fellow members of parliament, they're doing a little bit, they're, they're, their focus is a little bit different. Um, I would say the majority of MPs are actually concentrated on, on humanitarian work and relief. That is providing help to the, you know, to the civilians in the areas that were mostly severely hit by the war. Um, but then, of course, help in the military. And then, of course, we have a, a small but, uh, you know, important uh, portion of the parliament, uh, members of parliament who are serving in the military, including my, my best friend among the members of parliament. He's now serving in the south of the country. Uh, so, yeah, the work of the member of parliament is very different right now. But I think uh, the major mission is still the same, that is to represent the people. It's just in a situation of war, this has been performed differently compared to what it was before February 24th. Mm. Wow. Well, uh, Ukraine has a long history of fighting to become independent and become more democratic. What progress would you say have been made in the last 10 years regarding building democracy and cooperation and what is being lost right now? Well, I think uh, the building democracy is a very long term project. It, it takes uh, uh, decades uh, before a stable democracy can actually be built. And uh, I, I would say that uh, we have had uh, our progress in that sense. Uh, but uh, of course, it's not perfect. I wouldn't pretend Ukraine is a perfect democracy. Uh, I don't know if there is a perfect democracy uh, anywhere in the world, right? But uh, in terms of Ukraine, I think, um, unlike many post-Soviet countries, what we have definitely managed to uh, succeed in is holding free and open elections. Uh, I, uh, that is something that Putin is actually very scared of. That is one of the reasons why he is actually attacking Ukraine, because Ukraine has uh, proven that uh, a, function, a democracy where elites can change, can function on a post-Soviet space. And that is something that Putin, who has been uh, ruling uh, Russia since basically 2000, uh, with a small interruption when Medvedev was the president, uh, or so-called president, uh, he, he's, of course, very much afraid of that. Uh, we are now having the sixth president since 1991. Uh, so, so that is a, a big success. I might like, I might not like those presidents, but that is something that, that we are definitely good at. Uh, we do have uh, relatively free media. 
again, I'm not perfectly content with them, but they uh, are not, uh, you know, agents of the state as it is in Russia. Uh, they they do belong uh, to different uh, political uh, uh, affiliations, I would say. Let's put it this way. Um, so so we have that. Uh, we have made large progress in terms of gender equality, which is something that I'm particularly proud of uh, because that's something that I've been working a lot on, which is gender equality. Uh, and uh, actually right now, Uh, to connect to the issue of war and, and uh, democracy building, uh, about 18% of uh, the military are women, which is uh, one of the very high, highest percentages in the uh, Europe overall. Uh, we have been making progress in terms of uh, uh, developing the, the uh, human rights in other spheres, uh, for instance, LGBT rights, again, something that I have been working on a lot. Again, it's nowhere near perfect. We are st still not allowing single-sex unions and, and many other issues. Uh, but we can hold uh, parades, uh, uh, you know, in the streets of Kiev, which is, again, something that Russia cannot do. Mm -hmm. so, so if you look at those things, uh, we, we can... I wouldn't say I'm completely satisfied with the road of uh, Ukraine. And I do believe that we have so much more work to do ahead of us. But I think we are on the right path. And I think uh, that is what scared Putin most of all. And that is why he decided to attack Ukraine, because Ukraine chose a different path compared to Russia. And that is something that uh, we... Uh, sorry. Oh, wow. I'm sorry, that was uh, the air raid alert, which was off right now. Um And, and that is why, yeah, that's why he's, he's attacking us from air and on the ground because uh, uh, we have uh, been, uh, we have decided to go a different path compared to Russia. Again, I wouldn't pretend and say that we have uh, been uh, 100 successful on that path, but I would say that uh, we are definitely just on a different road. So we'll definitely have a different destination compared to Russia. Mm. What about the corruption and uh, the citizens' trust in institutions? Uh, that is indeed a problem. And uh, I'm, I'm saying that uh, as a representative of the parliament, but it, uh, also I should mention here that I'm actually representing uh, the opposition political party. And one of the strongest issues on, on agenda of my political party is actually fight against corruption. So uh, I'm not happy about the situation with corruption over here in Ukraine. Uh, we do have issues. I am unhappy with the oligarchs having too much power in Ukraine politics and economics uh, and in mass media as well. Uh, so uh, uh, there are issues with corruption. Uh, I do recognize those. Uh, there are some uh, some areas where the fight against corruption has been more successful. Uh, for instance, uh, we had huge problem in corrupt with corruption in education, uh, where university access was very corrupt before 2008. Then we uh, we have changed quite a lot uh, with the uh, independent test uh, being the single uh, mechanism for entering universities. Mm -hmm. And right now, uh, every people trust the, the, the university admission systems. But then if you look at other spheres like judicial reform, that is still uh, yet to come because we do have issues with, with our judicial system. Uh, and though we have been making steps in terms of reforming them, they have been not nearly perfect. So I'm, I'm not, you know, I wouldn't claim that this problem has been solved. This is a big problem for Ukraine. Uh, I would like uh, to see us concentrated more on that. And um, unfortunately, not enough has been done. But again, uh, many steps have been taken. In the, uh, anyways, uh, we have established the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, National Anti-Corruption Prosecutor's Office, National Anti-Corruption uh, Court. Again, they're just in the making. I mean, over here in Ukraine, um, particularly among the, the activist community, we are all wishing for the results to come right away, right? But with, with me having a background in education policy, And I remember how this national test was established to, to fix the problem of corruption in the university admission. And I know it took years. So I know it takes years to build the institutions that will be fighting corruption. We have built some of those, some more, some less successful. Um, so we just wait for them to, to provide the results. Uh, and and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm not happy with the results that we got so far. Uh, but again, the progress has been big compared to what we had um, eight years ago. Okay. So how, how much influence have Russia had over Europe? 
Ukraine during this period? How have they been able to influence? That depends on the period, because uh, if you look in Yanukovych years, that was uh, completely different. Those were the years where Russia did exert a huge control over Ukraine, where they could control, uh, uh, where they were making deals basically in the interests of Ukraine. And they were actually making them uh, and their major, inf uh, major um, instrument for uh, influencing were uh, the energy uh, sector, because uh, Ukraine grew dependent on Russian gas, Russian oil, and then Belarusian uh, oil as well a little bit. Um, and because of that, they, they did manage to trade favors in exchange for cheap gas and cheap oil. And those are the favors that cost us dearly. There was a deal that was made uh, uh, by pro-Russian governments that we did have a couple of times in, in 30 years of independence, where um, uh, in exchange for cheap gas, we allowed the Russian uh, military fleet to be stationed in Crimea. And look how that ended up uh, being used. You know, the, the, this is, a, a, it's not even a debate here in Ukraine. Everybody kind of recognizes it as a fact that because we wanted, uh, we, not we, but the country decided to go for cheap uh, gas, uh, we basically allowed the Russians to build their military base um, on the south of the country, which they later used uh, to take over parts of our territory. So, so uh, dependency on, on cheap Russian energy sources um, has been the major instrument through which Russia has been uh, uh, changing Ukrainian uh, political decisions and, and political system overall. That, of course, has changed a lot since 2014, after Russia and ex Crimea started the war in Donbass. It didn't exert direct influence over Ukraine, well, because it became pretty obvious for basically everyone in, in power uh, what Russia is and, and what it aims to achieve. Uh, but the influence has changed, because since 2014, we had to focus our attention of on a lot on getting rid of Russian influences, on, on you know, you know, paying more attention to the war, allocating resources to the war and all of that. And because of that, of course, uh, uh, Russia was still present uh, in Ukrainian politics, uh, but in a different manner, not by, by exerting direct uh, influence, but actually because we had to fight against that for the last eight years now. Uh, but uh, we still had a pro-Russian political party in the parliament. Uh, we had it up until recently. Uh, their level of support was varying. That truly really depended on, uh, on the year. But uh, up to 20% of people were voting for that pro-Russian uh, political party. Uh, they were present in the parliament uh, since February 24th, since the full-scale invasion. Uh, half of their MPs have fled the country, so they just left. But the other half that did stay in the parliament, right now they're actually voting in line with other uh, political parties. So they're now trying to change you know, their, their political positions and pretend like they have never been pro-Russian or anything. And I, th I think the experience of living under the airstrikes is eye-opening and for them as well. Uh, so they actually have, uh, uh, I think, I think some things have changed in their minds, but it's not like I'm willing to forgive them for uh, serving as vehicles of, of uh, Russian uh, uh, interventions over here in Ukraine, because they, they were indeed. And of course, uh, even though we were trying to uh, become uh, less dependent on Russia, truth be told, we have still been dependent on Russia and, and Belarus on fuel for instance. And that is something that we are seeing right now, today, in, in Ukraine, because uh, uh, right now we do have uh, huge fuel shortages all over the country. It's, it's basically impossible to, to buy fuel for your car. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that is because we have been so much dependent on Russia, even up during the last eight years, that we didn't have alternatives uh, uh, and alternative routes for, for delivering fuel to uh, Ukraine. And now Russia has, has used it and then was expected that they would use it. But unfortunately, that has not changed them. Um, um, well, what do you consider to be the main reason for this war? Is it that you've gone on that road of becoming more democratic? Or is it um, something else that's been luring? And uh, you said that the fossil resources have been a great factor in this war. 
but it seems to go both ways like you have had this cheap uh or like you've had um uh, this resource quite cheap and then been able to build up your economy maybe more but maybe it's so uh one short comment about uh, whether that helped to build the economy, because uh, I understand that dependency on cheap uh, energy sources is allowing you to survive uh, uh, short term, mm. but it actually, uh, at the end, you get stuck and you get dependent on those cheap resources. Mm. And instead of developing uh, alternative uh, energy sources, instead of uh, thinking about innovations, instead of uh, investing in more innovative sectors of economy, Ukraine actually got, you know, uh, it got addicted to these cheap energy sources. And at the end, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it was not beneficial for the economy even. Uh, you see, Ukrainian economy, was, it, it's so much dependent and it's so much use these cheap energy sources that it failed to deliver on, you know, on innovations uh, in, in many other sectors. Uh, we had cheap uh, fuel from uh, from Belarus and Russia, so we didn't invest enough in I don't know uh, building infrastructure for electric cars around the country, which would have come in handy very much right now in this situation we're in now. So, so this dependency on energy sources it does solve short term political problems and and you know short term economic problems as well. But it's actually very bad mid-term and, and long-term, of course, particularly if we keep in mind the, the, the climate uh, uh, crisis that we're living through right now. Uh, unfortunately, not everybody understands that. Uh, we have, as a party, have always been uh, saying that, probably explains our very low level of support among the Ukrainian population, because we have always been telling the truth that this cheap Russian gas always costs you a lot in the long run, you know, and I think that is something that Europe needs to understand right now as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I wouldn't say that, that this, uh, uh, I would say that Russia has definitely been using energy as a way of, of changing politics and policies all over the world, particularly in Europe. Uh, but I would say that energy is is the instrument, not the, the goal in itself. And I think if if uh, if we speak about the goal, the goals are a bit more complex. And I think that is uh, some sort of r revival of Russian Russian imperial ambitions, and they they are now trying to reclaim parts of the territories all over Europe uh, to be Russian, uh, to reclaim this uh, you know uh, the status of a grand power. But they're not doing that based on, on, you know, innovations, based on proposing new progressive thinking or anything. They're doing that as, as they used to do 100 years ago, but, but sheer force and then, you know, um, the intervention in, in other countries' affairs. So I think those uh, unfulfilled the imperial ambitions uh, um, and with the access to cheap energy sources have led to, to this war altogether. So, so they had the instrument. And they had the ambitions and probably the trauma from the past of, you know, losing the status of a great power. Uh, and that is uh, something that they try to reclaim right now, rather as unsuccessfully, truth be told. I'm very proud for the Ukrainian army to be able to stop their uh, efforts in that. Uh, yeah, but I think, again, energy is the instrument. Uh, those imperial ambitions are, are the source um, and um, of this terrible and terrifying war. But if you ask Russians about what the, the goal of the war is, I wouldn't, I, I'm not sure if they would actually be even able to answer that question to you. I'm not sure how they explain this war to, 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 to themselves. Uh, now, because I think there have been so much victims of the propaganda uh, that they cannot even explain very basic things. And then they're, they're saying very contradictory things altogether. Uh, but yeah, I think the major issue is this, those imperialist ambitions of, of uh, Russia. Uh, in the media, we talk a lot about Putin and we call this Putin's war. Um, is it, could it really just be one man's stupidity or who and what do you hold accountable? Could we just get rid of Putin and this will end and it would never have happened? Well, that's a great question because I think um, it's very tempting to think that uh, it's Putin's war against Ukraine. And if we get rid of Putin, if he dies, and I, I very much like the idea, 
But you have to realize that that's, that will not solve the problems altogether. Because unfortunately, about 80% of Russians support this war in Ukraine. 80%. And, and, we, are, uh, and, and you, we, can pre- we can think that maybe they don't know how this war looks like. But they actually do know. They actually understand that uh, this brings in levels of, of, uh, of human rights abuse, of, of, you know, they understand how terrifying that is, and they're fine with that. And that is the most terrifying thing about it altogether, I think. Uh, there was uh, a very, I'll give you just a couple of examples of that. Well, maybe the, the major example, something that has changed uh, the way people understand how Russian society is thinking, uh, were the events around uh, Kyiv in the towns of Bucha and Irpin, uh, which everybody has, has read about with, with mass executions, with rape, uh, uh, rape of women, rape of children uh, in those areas. And, uh, uh, but there was le- probably a less reported story, but I think very telling story, because Russian soldiers who have been stationed in Bucha and Irpin, they uh, would go into people's houses, take everything they see there, and send that back to their homes in Russia. So, so they would come in. And the, the most, like the most vividly reported, uh, uh, were the fact that they were stealing the washing machines uh, and sending them to their wives back in Russia. And there were actually multiple, multiple reports of of their wives uh, saying, like, "Oh, that's great. Can you also find me this, like a mixer, a hair dryer, or something?" And then if you look for clothes, please make sure you get the right size. So, so this is just something you have to bear in mind that it was okay for their wives to be saying things like that. You just go to another woman's home, take the stuff that belongs to her, take the stuff that belongs to her child and send it back to home to me. So it's not just, you know, this cannot be explained by Putin's actions. Those were the decisions of individual Russian soldiers and their wives and how they see the, you know, what is normal, what is okay to do. And definitely this is not okay to do. And I'm not even talking about the rape, uh, which again, like how do you normalize race, rape? How do you uh, make it acceptable? But again, there was, um, uh, there was uh, uh, um, an, a conversation leaked uh, between a Russian soldier and, a, and his wife, uh, uh, and uh, she was saying, well, while you rape Ukrainian women, please use protection. That was her only concern, like use protection. That, so, so, uh, so I'm just giving those ex- ex- examples to, to explain that I wish I could say that this is Putin's war. But unfortunately, the, the people in Russia, they have been brainwashed for years and they have happily accepted these roles right now, the majority of them, that is. Uh, and and uh, they have, um, uh, they are now the, the, you know, the agents in this war as much as Putin is. So simply by destroying Putin, unfortunately, we wouldn't really be able to solve this war altogether. Unfortunately, as much as I wished for that uh, to come. And I think like, like uh, Nazi Germany had to go through a very long, complicated uh, history of, of uh, uh, you know, uh, normalizing the society. That is something that will have to happen to Russia as well, because uh, yeah, the level of, of uh, brainwashedness, if you can say, of, of Russian people is just uh, unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you, Ina. Um, we will continue on with some questions for, for Evgenia. Welcome into the conversation. Hello, thank you for the invitation. So, what kind of work and support can you do here from Sweden? Mm-hmm. I actually want to clarify, I'm not in Sweden. I'm in the EU and I've been forced to move from my hometown in Kharkiv. It's East Ukraine and the city is bombed and like from the first day and like uh, didn't stop even for the day. Uh, my parents also have been like forced to move, so we moved to East Ukraine, like to the safer place, and now I moved to EU. Hopefully, like for a short period, and soon I'll be able to come back and, uh, yeah, uh, trying to rebuild Ukraine. Uh, but uh, I'm continuing to work for Environmental Angel Action. It's the organization where I worked in Ukraine. 
uh, for the five years, last five years. And uh, one of my work is now related to monitoring environment, uh, monitoring the cases which can bring negative environmental harm in the future and now. Uh, plus, we're advocating for embargo fossil fuel, which is like now the main source, one of the main sources, which is bring like finance to Russia, uh, which is give them the money to buy, uh, buy tanks, missiles, and everything like to my city. Sometimes like average 50 missiles are flying like to the city uh, nonstop. So some uh, region is occupied like the, the half of uh, the region is occupied and like east and south ukraine is like the constant bomb and shilling and this is possible through the fossil fuel so actually i worked in like action it's uh, before we've been focused on climate policy we try to raise climate ambition in ukraine and now it's clearly see that the fossil fuel can break not only on, not only climate change but on uh, also war in peaceful country like independent and that's why it's like another reason why we need to stop the dependence of fossil fuel like in Ukraine and Europe and in the whole world uh, to like don't have any possibilities changes to come back to such situations currently in Ukraine. Wow. I'm so I'm so sorry to hear to hear all of that. That's incredibly tragic to be a part of, of course. Um, what uh, environmental consequences can you see so far from the war in Ukraine? Uh, so for now, we monitored uh, 218 cases, which can bring like a negative environmental harm. Why uh, we are saying possible? Uh, because it's impossible to check, go to the East Ukraine and see what's actually happening in there. Plus the war actually began in 2014. So to Donbass region, we don't have any access from that period. So we don't know what happened there during the last eight years and what environmental consequences have been there. Uh, now we are only using open sources, media, regional, national, checking what's happening. So if we see industrial facility damages, uh, energy safety, nuclear safety, any negative cases that can bring also to a negative impact to ecosystem or marine ecosystem, you can have two seas. It's Azov and Black Sea, and there has been like some ships uh, boats bombed uh, from russia or from ukraine so it's actually like affect uh, a lot marine ecosystem we also monitor nuclear uh, safety in ukraine because ukraine have four, four nuclear power plant station uh, russia occupied chernobyl zone and uh, but now they left the territory but uh, when they've been uh, they when they've been there we uh, through the open sources through the monitoring we saw that uh, there has been like a rise level for radiation uh, it was the, because the tanks and the machine pass the red forest and it's like that's the reason why the radiation is actually raised from so from the ground to this radiation uh, like went to the air uh, and uh, in Ukraine they actually even been a little bit happy that maybe this radiation would affect this Russian troops and they would like uh, feel at least from this harm, but um, yeah, that's not enough, unfortunately. And now they also occupied in uh, the Parisian nuclear power plant station. Uh, they also monitored from open sources that uh, two missiles uh, flew over the Parisian station and uh, South uh, Ukraine nuclear power plant station. So they just threatening the whole world uh, with such uh, actions. Uh, Zaporizhia is the biggest nuclear power plant station in Europe, so it means if something going to happen there, so its second Chernobyl will be like in the world, so everybody will feel it. Uh, from uh, from another cases, which is like mostly will be affected by, uh, we, we will feel uh, on the like on Ukrainian territory or maybe partly on Russia, because for example on Donbass region. 
which has been, uh, they've been occupied it from 2014, but uh, it's a coal mining region. And uh, there is a few coal mines been uh, flooded because of Russian actions. They cut electricity there. So the pipe couldn't take out the groundwater from that uh, mines. There is also news that around 30 mines have been flooded on occupied area. So it means that uh, actually polluted groundwater is going to, to the people's houses. And it's not only to Ukraine, but to Russia too, because it's close to the Russian border and groundwater it's, uh, doesn't have the border of countries. So it will affect them too. Uh, and yeah, we have a lot of cases every day, like, uh, a few cases more uh, in the beginning of the wars we monitor like tens and more uh, cases now it's a little bit less but uh, one of the one of the reasons we don't know the all information uh, because like a lot of territory just occupied it so there is no independent media who would like broadcast and share the, what's actually happening there all right so Russia and Ukraine are also great exporters of grain and together you account for a third of the world's wheat and barley exports. Millions of people may suffer from malnutrition due to the war and lack of uh, arable land. Uh, Russian bombardments uh, have also started forest fires, as you said, with, um, the, within the Chernobyl zones. Uh, and this may um, affect the land and the uh, the grains as well so can you explain perhaps um, the short and long-term harm to the environment and especially the arable land uh, yes yeah, so actually some part of ukraine are very like, uh, safer so people come back and they went to uh, agriculture sector and like trying to grow up at least something uh, even though like the missiles rockets is flying over like ukraine every day and it's like uh, the biggest part is in is uh, still in East Ukraine, but still like a few missiles been a few days ago in Viv, it's West Ukraine, which is close to Poland and in other regions too. Uh, so uh, how it's affecting like in long term and short term, uh, all these bombs, missiles, uh, any military activities there and plus there is also around now 7,000 destroyed uh, military machines. It's tanks, cars, and different other kinds. I don't know, name all of them. Uh, it's like around more than 10,000 now. And it's also waste that can bring like, uh, um, it's uh, called like waste that can uh, pollute from the chemical side. So all these missiles, bombs, they have uh, not only steel and uh, copper inside, they also have uh, sulfur, uh, which is can uh, pollute the, the soil, the groundwater, uh, plus all these tanks and, uh, when they burned or just like, uh, I don't know, there is even the news that Russian troops ju just leave them on Ukrainian territory. So if they are not utilized, um, it means that it would also affect the uh, environment around. Uh, so it's another challenge to Ukraine would be after the war was finished to actually utilize very quick uh, all this military waste. And we didn't have any experience before, so probably they are going to be needed some help from. Uh, countries who had that before. I don't know. I know that Germany had some factories that can utilize and do something with the tanks. Maybe some other countries too had such, uh, but it's important to do it like as fast as possible. Of course, like the territory of Ukraine is huge, like uh, 7,000 uh, military machines do just like one can like be a few thousand ton or a few tons uh, we just like need to be uh, moved somewhere and so on so it would be like a huge challenge but we will need to do it fast I hope so mm -hmm. well we have Inna who wants to add 
Yeah, I would like to add uh, one, uh, two points on that. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, in terms of the economics of the issue of, of uh, agriculture, uh, there was uh, uh, some uh, analysis of the situation and the worst case scenario shows that Ukraine would be able to plant about 70% of its crops compared to the year before. So 70% is actually not as bad as we have envisioned at the very beginning of the war, uh, but it's still, you know, it's still a 30% loss, but it's still, you know, we still can, can plant about 70% of, of that. And of course, we are experiencing major losses because uh, uh, of the parts of the territories, particularly on the south, which are important agricultural areas uh, being under Russian control. So we can't really expect any uh, mass, uh, you know, uh, plantations over there. Uh, but then also because uh, parts of the territories have indeed been contaminated, as, as Evhenia have, uh, have been saying, uh, because of the war. Uh, but the issue is is not just the, uh, the problems arise, not just from the occupation of the land, but also because of the further logistics of the harvest uh, to other places. Because with Russia having control over the Black Sea ports, we would not be able actually to export the grains that we shall grow. And, and all, uh, we, uh, so, so we are going to consume about half of what we shall produce this year. So we do not expect uh, any food shortages in the major territories of Ukraine. But of course, we have been an important source of, uh, of grains and other, and, uh, and other uh, goods, agricultural goods for other countries. And they will be experiencing problems, again, not on our fault, not because we didn't grow them, but because we do not have the logistic systems in place to deliver those goods to other countries, like to Egypt, to Bangladesh, to other countries that we have been selling grain to. Uh, and, and because, uh, yeah, again, the, the, almost all trade was done uh, through marine routes, which are unavailable right now. Uh, so, so that is one of the issues that needs to be worked on right now, like access to the European ports through the ground, through the railroads, some needs to be done because we, we are willing to trade, we are willing to, you know, to continue to supply the world with the grains. Uh, it's the matter of logistics, which is which is crucially important. We needs to be worked out. But then there is another issue, and if it's possible to to show the picture that I, I sent a little bit uh, before, uh, then there is an issue of mining of the lands in Ukraine, and that is uh, in addition again to what has been said. Uh, this is a huge problem. Over here, you can see the territory that uh, needs to be uh, you know surveyed by uh, by the miners or deminers, if you call it. Uh, and it's a huge territory. And of course, you also have to remember Ukraine is a very big country. So uh, if you look at the con uh, at the territories that have been contaminated because of the land mines, it's about 14% of Ukrainian territory right now, which is dangerous due to mining. And the, the, well, just to put it into perspective, the contaminated uh, territory today is the size of Austria. So, so imagine uh, inspecting the whole Austria uh, in order to find the, you know, the, the landmines. That, of course, is, is a huge, uh, a huge uh, undertaking. And if you compare it to some other military conflicts, uh, uh, like, of course, there have been uh, the issue with mining in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the war in the early 90s over there. But the territory that was contaminated uh, as a result of mining over there was 70 times smaller than the area that has been contaminated by landmines in Ukraine right now. Uh, so, so that is, uh, again, one of the biggest issues, particularly like if you look at the north, uh, uh, again, uh, those are the territories where we could be growing things, which where, where we were growing things, but we are unable to do that. So right now, until the area is inspected, and that is probably one of the areas where, uh, well, Sweden as well could provide support uh, in terms of demining of the territories, uh, uh, because that needs to be done, because that truly affects not just uh, the livelihoods of people, because, of course, they have, uh, you know, people need to go back and then they cannot go back until the area is inspected. But also the, the economics, including the particular, mainly the agricultural economics of Ukraine. So, so that is important to keep in mind as well. Thank you for, for allowing me to intervene here. Yes. Um, on the 7th of uh, April, uh, the European Union uh, had a vote and took a stand on no uh, uh, imports of Russian oil from 2023. Uh, but there was no 
plan put in place how how they would go about that and some countries are heavily dependent how do you think that would be possible what should a plan look like to realize this about uh, oil embargo they still in process to actually have it so, so there is no decision and hungary is actually trying to do as much as they can to not have this decision like for the whole eu uh there there is a decision about embark on coal uh, and some discussion about the gas but now like uh, the main richest discussion about the embargo on oil then uh yeah sanction for the oil call it as you like uh so uh there is a lot of um calculation modelings that uh, provides that it's possible. It wouldn't be that easier because still like, Russia provides uh, not only to Ukraine, but uh, to Europe to cheap fossil fuel. And it's like, uh, uh, and everybody now depends and it's clearly show like uh, what kind of harm it can bring. So that means that everybody need to stop this dependency on Russia from uh, any sources and it's actually there is not so many discussion but uh, Russia also exporting uranium uh, which is for example US uh, they put a ban on all fossil fuel except uranium uh, and uh, there is also some EU country which is also depend on not even like uh, this discussion even not raising and like, even didn't start so there is like a lot of, uh, uh, I don't know, would that call it lobby or a lot of interest from different sides who's trying to postpone to stop any possibilities to actually put embargo. There's hopefully a lot of um, uh, civil society movements, uh, politicians, deputies, people who is really support Ukraine, who see like what kind of harm it, it can bring. So they are like pushing the government, but uh, it's unfortunately not happening as fast as uh, we in Ukraine would expect it because like every day postponement of this decision, it means like every day people dying and it's like Ten hundreds thousands sometimes and uh, like every day uh, it means like more people is going to die even like uh, that embargo on coal that they put it's going to happen only from September if I'm right so actually it would not affect Russia like from the moment when this de decision been made uh, so it's important to actually like make this decision now and like looking for any any other opportunities to uh yeah to stop it there is clearly uh, because i'm like from environmental ngo we've worked on climate so we're clearly not support to find another country uh that would bring like to you another fossil fuels it's important to develop energy efficiency uh renewable power plant stations which is like it would give uh and ukraine and you like to be more independent not to be dependent on any aggressors country uh, uh, and like uh, whatever uh, who can like try to influence democracy and uh, from different perspectives uh, so it's actually important to there is a chance there is like a possibility so it's only need to be uh, made a decision and after uh, uh, the ways would be found I would say like that all right so we would like to uh, play a short clip from uh, Russian state uh, television where they are discussing how this war would actually end. It, the clip is about one minute. And then we would like you to give your comments on this. Мы проигрываем на Украине или начинается Третья мировая. Лично я считаю наиболее более реалистичным путь Третьей мировой. Ну, потому что, зная нас, зная нашего руководителя Путина Владимира Владимировича, вот самое невероятное, что в конце концов все это закончится ядерным ударом, 
мне представляется все же более вероятным, чем вот такое развитие событий. К ужасу моему, с одной стороны, с другой стороны, к пониманию, что, ну что, значит так. Знаешь, меня... Но мы это в рай. Да. Меня... А они просто а... What do you think when you hear this? Maybe we can start with uh, Evgenia. Uh, so, yeah, it's actually clearly showing what's happening in Russia. So how much people support this. This war is not only about Putin. It's like the whole Russian society nations, which is like hate Ukrainians and they're ready to begin like a, Uh, um, they saying that uh, the third world war will begin, but actually, uh, like in Ukraine, we see that it's already happening. Uh, the nuclear weapon, like to use nuclear weapon, it would mean it's it would affect not only Ukraine or any other countries. It would also affect Russia, and if they are willing to kill themselves, uh, it's even like too hard to. <laughs> find the right words like uh, they're willing to sacrifice for some brainwashing use and try to believe in anything uh, but like not to even try to understand what's happening in the world why uh, the, the whole world is against Russia uh, so they're okay with this position and it's clear that um, Uh, Russia need to be stopped in like different ways. It's embargo, it's fifth, uh, it's like yeah, economy embargo and uh, from uh, all sectors and so on. If I may, uh, there have of course been uh, lots of uh, media clips like that where they are. Uh, Uh, where you can actually see how this brainwashing is 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 functioning in Russia, and uh, well, the people that you have shown are the main Russian propagandists uh, in uh, in what they call media, which of course is not a media; it's basically a propaganda machine uh, that is functioning in one way. It's not you know a medium between co of communication; it's actually just a propaganda machine of of Russia. Now, truth be told, I do not believe in nuclear strike. Because uh, you can say whatever about Putin and about people around him, uh, but they all like the idea of surviving. And they all like the idea of living to the best of their lives. And, and I think they all realize that in case of nuclear strike, if, in case they try to go for nuclear strike, there will be a retail retaliation and that uh, other nuclear powers will actually respond. And that will lead to a whole disaster, which is uh, just unthinkable, you know, but, uh, but uh, they cannot pretend to enjoy the process. And this phrase that in case of nuclear attack, and that's all of you always saying, like, we, we will definitely go to heaven. Well, they definitely won't. But also, I, th I think that it's just a bravada. It's just them pretending to be those, you know, tough guys that they, they like to be. But in fact, they, they like living good lives. They like going shopping to Italy. They like sending their children to study in the UK. They like doing business in, in the United States and all of that. So they're not those, you know, brave soldiers willing to sacrifice their own well-being. They actually like living a good life and or actually living, you know. So, so I do not, well, of course, we are terrified of the perspective of the nuclear strike. Trust me, no, no, none of us wants that, uh, particularly the country that had lived actually through the biggest nuclear disaster in the world, which, is, which was uh, Chernobyl uh, nuclear power um, a disaster. Uh, so, so we are extremely aware of that. We do not want that. But it also doesn't mean that uh, Russia can use this nuclear threat, uh, you know, as a bully saying that if you don't do this, then we shall hit you with a nuclear strike. Well, they, they, then they, th this is an argument which can go on forever. We cannot allow them to be using this argument uh, because, uh, you know, then it means that we can allow them to, you know, to continue killing, raping, uh, you know, stealing and all of that just because they can, might be using this argument. So this perspective is very scary, uh, but I, um, I truly believe that the, the chances of that happening are, are very, very small. And again, this is a very scary perspective. We don't want that. Trust me, we are doing everything now power to stop that. But the best way to stop this right now is actually to uh, change regime in Russia. And that is what is needed. 
because we do need regime which will not be even thinking about saying anything like that. We need a regime that will demilitarize Russia, that will denazify Russia. That is what is needed. Uh, that will take time and effort, but, but it is possible. And in order for that to happen, what we need is, is pressure on people who matter in Russia. And also not the millions of regular Russians, but the Russian elites. And that is why, uh, in addition to the like oil and gas embargo, we are also asking for individual and personal sanctions against Russian elites and their family members. Mm. And once the you know the the daughter of, of Russian members of parliament and their sons would not be able to travel to Italy to do their shopping, then they will just say, start thinking like maybe we should really not go any further because they they like their comfortable and rich lives uh, and and they need to be prevented from living those lives and then they will actually force the regime change in Russia and then those threats of nuclear strikes would not be possible. Thank you. We would also like to see if there are any viewers that have uh, questions that they would like to ask to Virginia and Inna. This has been really interesting discussion and time has gone by very fast. But if you have any questions, you're welcome to post them. I'm also going to um, uh, ask another question while we see if there are some viewers that want to ask. Uh, how can there be an exit for Putin where he can in some way um, declare a win or that uh, leave this war with pride? Is there a way? And what is the, what is the consequence if, if there's not a way for him to do that? Well, there was a historical example that I like, uh, that of Hitler. I think that is the only outcome we can accept, uh, accept and expect. Because truth be told, I do not see a positive outcome for him. Because he can either continue this war endlessly or until that is the Russian army is able to support this war, which wouldn't be too long because you have to realize that Russian army uh, they, they were claiming this is the second largest and strongest army in the world, but it is actually very much dependent on uh, uh, innovations that are developed on the West. And without the, you know, uh, uh, with the uh, sanctions, the Russians would not have access to lots of technologies that they're using to develop their weapons. So they would not be able to continue this war endlessly. And Ukraine is, is, is happy to have strong allies. And then, you know, the weapon supplies have actually started to Ukrainian army. So we should be able to, to pr support this war longer than Russia, actually, at this point. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so I don't think that they can last very long. Uh, and then they will have to find some way to exit this war. And I don't think a dictator like Putin can survive this uh, exit from the war without victory, with him staying in his position. So truth be told, I do not see a positive outcome for, for, for Putin from this war. No, not neither am, am I looking for that, but I, I, I just don't see that happening. Like from a historical standpoint, he cannot win, definitely. He cannot even claim the victory. And right now we are recording this on May 9th, which is the, the victory day in Russia. And, and, you know, there were lots of discussions about what sort of victory would they declare today? Uh, would they go for full-scale mobilization? Would they go for full-scale war or anything? They didn't go for anything. Like Putin's speech was, you know, uh, remarkable for the absence of any, you know, goals that he's setting for his own army right now. So uh, I think they're at the crossroads right now where they cannot really go further, but they cannot stop. Uh, and I think, again, the issue is with Russian political elites, whether they would be willing to intervene and actually to stop Putin internally while we are doing that uh, from the outside with the Ukrainian army fighting against Russians. Because truth be told, I'm not seeing a positive outcome for Putin, and I don't think uh, anyone else in the world can draw this positive picture. Because the arguments like we can compromise, uh, trust me, we wouldn't. Not after what has happened, not after what they have done to, to, to our land. We shall not compromise, neither should we be asked to compromise on, on, on the sovereignty of our state. So we are not giving up, and, and uh, well, 
Putin will have to yeah, study the historical examples of what dictators that invaded other countries did to themselves uh, uh, when they realized that they are losing the war. Thank you. Uh, this, um, thank you for tonight. This conversation has been recorded, so it's possible to see this uh, on the Climate Alliance uh, YouTube channel. And uh, the next episode. Uh, yes. Um, a huge thanks to both of you. Uh, really, we will um, follow your journey and hopefully we will see the light of the tunnel. Um, and all luck and uh, uh, strength to you both. Um, Thank you so much. So. Yes, the next episode will will have a guest called Brian Palmer here, and he is a social anthropologist and scholar of religion at Uppsala University. He's also from America, where he was teaching at Harvard, and he has worked with different courses on civic courage and uh, ways of. Um, 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 creating social criticism in different ways and seeing how and what is making uh, is creating a threat towards uh, our civilizations and uh, next week we will be talking about civic courage and how to spur the world for peace and uh, I hope to see you then and that talk will be in Swedish. Yeah, and we will also talk about how to build uh, trust in uh, society and how to work for social justice. So welcome to that talk and really thanks again, Inna and Virginia. This is so important. Big thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.